old Fallout developers talking about the state of modern gaming. This is going to be interesting. Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about something that, for a lack of a better phrase, I'm going to call game development caution. Okay. Before I start, I'm going to tell you three different stories. They're a little different, but then I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. A boomer telling you stories about the life that was better before. Wow. Who, who would have expected that on one hand? But it's probably going to be good. Because you get, again, it's just old fella. Back when we made Fallout, towards the end, when we were really trying to get it out, okay. we had two whiteboards. One whiteboard had a list of features or content that weren't done yet that really needed to get in. Mm -hmm. And the other whiteboard had a list of what the 10 most <clears throat> egregious bugs were and next to each person next mm -hmm. to each one of these on these two different whiteboards were listed the person who was assigned to it okay we did it in a whiteboard like this so that people could come in the morning and look at it because this predated jira or confluence or anything like that they could come in look at the whiteboard and go oh i see something i need to jump on yeah worked fine makes but makes perfect sense this is how everyone does it this is how everyone has done it in every company ever you have jobs that are assigned to you if you don't have like one menial day-to-day -day task that you do every day it is what it is i don't think i heard any complaint about it people liked getting stuff off of that if they saw something i was like i'm on that today try doing the exact same thing Ten years later, at Carbine, okay. overwhelmingly, people said, no, do not do that. I will quit if you do that. Why? If I see my... Because it's competition? Because they don't want to be the last ones to do it? Because they don't want to figure out who's the worst one? Because they're all afraid to be the worst ones? This is interesting. My name on that whiteboard, I will quit. And I said, well, what if we don't put people's names next to it? I'll still quit. People will know it's me. Yeah. That's the only thing that can make sense. And this is so... Wait, this is so fucked up. Because competition is one of the greatest motivators that you can abuse against humans. In situations like this, in a work environment... How incompetent do you need to be? You need to understand that everyone around you is to do this. Because yeah, it's it's. If you know psychology, that uh, this has only that outcome. People are afraid to be incompetent. That is crazy. That is crazy that everyone wants uh, uh, is this incompetent and they fucking know it. Do all of those people working there just randomly talk about how great they are and stuff? Wow. Hey. Hey. I have been saying this for quite a while. Don't give the devs slack. They're probably incompetent. And this is incompetency at the greatest level. Because usually people want to compete. That's the thing. That's the motivator. That's the thing that happens. People want to compete because they want to be good and show that they're good. But now you have people who are blatantly saying, if you do this, I'm going to quit. Then fire them. They don't deserve to be there. If they do that, that is an automatic firing. Because that just that, that is a literal... Raise your hands up if you are absolutely inept and clueless about what you're doing in this job. That's what it is. Story two. When we were making The Outer Worlds, <clears throat> I wanted to put in... This is probably year end of year two, so we're still a year away. The combat AI wasn't really in yet so I asked for a very simple combat aggression code to be added 
it was this is how simple it was every time an npc got shot this is the first time i even even hear the words combat aggression called wow they would see if that person was on the list of someone who'd shot them if they weren't they'd add them to the list which the amount of, with the amount of damage they just took if they were already on the list they would just add the amount of damage they took okay whenever they're deciding who to attack they attack the person at the top of the list oh that's it that's all i wanted keep in mind the advantage of that basic ai you can make lots of changes later you can make them that it has the the one at the top of the list if it's different than the person you're attacking the damage has to exceed the damage of, of the person attacking you by a certain amount before you're changed targets you can take distance into account you can take whether you can reach them into account whether you have a ranged weapon into account. yeah makes all sense. that comes later that's all i wanted yeah i don't know and i i know psychology but i don't understand anything about programming computers black magic literally you're never gonna convince me that's not magic but you know whatever uh it got put into the programmer production query queue and came back with oh, an estimate of four weeks it's quaddy dude it's fucking quaddy i pushed back saying the code i asked for was very simple i've written it before would take about 45 minutes it's basically there's already a callback when you get hit that's when you look to put them on the list and there's a callback there's a, a call when you want to pick a target that's when you look at the list and see which one you want to attack that's it Wait, so you're telling me Starfield doesn't even have that? <laughs> yeah, because there's so many situations in Starfield where you shoot some enemy and it just keeps on moving or doing whatever it's doing and completely ignores that it's taking damage until the point it collapses. So you're telling me this is something super basic done in 40 minutes and Starfield doesn't even have that. That's impressive. That that is impressive level levels of bad. Programmer who it got signed to came to me and said, "I need four weeks." And I'm like, "Why? Walk me through what you're gonna do." And he goes, "You don't understand." And I was like, "I've coded this three times." Then make me Walk understand. Me yeah. And he wouldn't. He left. That's that's firing. That's firing on the spot. Again, I I, I did. Man, oh my god. Good thing that he left because you should fire him again. This is what I'm talking about uh, incompetent developers. Look at this. This guy says this is 14 minutes. That guy t says that's four weeks. It may it, it, so, suddenly why games are trash makes uh, it all makes sense now, doesn't it? It just puts into perspective everything. He left angry. Lead Obviously, came back, started yelling at me saying if he says he needs four weeks he needs four weeks and i'm like then i will do it i'll have it done before lunch and he said no because no one then people will have to support your code i'm like well let me walk through. what does support your code mean i'm gonna walk you through what i want and you tell me why this takes four weeks he looked at what i wrote which was about 10 lines of pseudo code on a whiteboard and he goes i'll come back he came back about an hour later and said what about two weeks and i said do i have any options here fine two weeks Jesus Christ, that's so... Dude, fire everyone. Just just fire these people. Why is this accepted in game development? Why is incompetence so prevalent and accepted in game development? I have worked in big, uh, big businesses, big firms. Bro, if you're not... If you're not capable of doing things... You know, that other people know that are doable in a very, very short amount of time. You're probably getting fired really, really fast. Yeah, people are gonna, uh, you know, if, if people figure out that you're not capable of doing this, that should be done in an hour, but you're taking two days for it, someone's gonna uh, probably be sent to teach you. And if you fail after that, well, you're gone, boy. You're, you're gone. And you, because you don't deserve to be there in the first place. Story three. Letter. Admittedly, admittedly, I will still I will tell you this. You know who are the most valuable people in a company? You know who are the hardest workers in a company? It's definitely not the people who can do uh, those things in one hour. No, 
Those are the people, like me, who can do the hard, complicated things in one hour. But you do it in two days. Because the last person needed five days to accomplish. And you're saying, yeah, this is... And, and you sell it. You sell it like there's no tomorrow. How hard the thing that you're going to be doing is. How important it is. And how everyone should be happy, lucky, and literally licking your boots because you are so capable of doing it in two days instead of five. Well, in reality, it takes you roughly an hour. You, doing that, become the most valuable person ever. Again, it's not about actually being good. Everything is pre presentation. And these people are failing at the most basic thing. Because you need to lie about the presentation. And these people are like... And by the way, obviously, some of you are smart. Some of you are saying, wait, but what if he uh, walks you through what's happening here? Well, first of all, you need uh, that's obviously what you take into account if you're smart. You take into account, does the person asking this know what can be done, how fast it's actually doable, and do they understand it? Because if they don't, I just fucking give them a bunch of bullsh uh, bullshit. And usually they will, you know, just say, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. Because no one wants to live. Do you know what people hate to listen to? Things that they don't understand. No one likes not understanding anything. So start telling people about something that they don't understand. And they're going to leave. They're going to not like it. They're not, not going to want to hear it. This is why I usually try to... Uh, present things as understandable as possible because you will leave the video if you don't understand what I'm saying so you know I'm trying my best here but yeah and the other uh, the other option obviously is the fact that well they they do understand what's happening and you need to figure out which uh, wh uh, which is the one that's be uh, that that is asking you do they understand what they're asking do they not understand what they're asking that's how you grow and I talk about features all the time, whether it's dialogues or system mechanics or story setting, we get very into it. Our voices may be raised. We're jumping out of our chairs to draw things on whiteboards. Yep, makes We're sense. We're pacing back and forth. I know I've mentioned this okay, okay, before. Okay, okay, it doesn't make sense, but uh, yelling? This is... Uh, Everyone, everyone on Twitch and YouTube who tells you, oh, you shouldn't yell, be like an adult. Fuck you, you absolute schmuck loser with no real life experience. People yell constantly. If people are not yelling in a business meeting, I honestly think there's probably something going wrong. <laughs> it's true. It's true. People yell. When they're figuring things out like this, people yell a lot. You know, but it Anthony is what it Davis is. showed up at our door and said, "You, you guys have to stop yelling. Everybody's getting nervous. It's like mom and dad are yelling at each other." Still don't know Sucks. who he meant with mom, but we explained that's just us talking. We're not mad, but we're trying to tease apart exactly what to do, and we're getting into it. So, what do those three stories have to do with each other? Actually, I have no idea what these stories have to do with each other. <laughs> You'd think I would, but I don't. Because I know what the story is in general. It's some kind of teaching story. It's some kind of explanation thing that people with experience usually have this. People who have done good, people who have achieved things, have stories of examples of how things happening. This is why I always give an, uh, this is why I always give examples of how uh, how I use people manipulation because examples are just great and easy. I'm starting to see in the industry. I shouldn't say starting. In the last decade, the last quarter of my career, I'm starting to see this rise of what I can only call development caution, an abundance of caution uh, of padding estimates uh time yeah. estimates of wanting to go around and check with a lot of people to see if something's okay asking should we do this i'm not sure let's have a meeting frequently 
Meetings are good, but if meetings happen uh, once a week for pr even big projects, that's probably too much. Now, obviously, exceptions are exceptions, and there's always exceptions, but too many meetings usually should not happen, even for massive projects. You have a meeting, you figure out uh, which department does what, which, which people do what, which people are responsible for uh, which other people, and then you move from there. And if something needs to be adjusted because someone has found something that is uh, that is uh, altering the course of what's happening, then you can have a meeting. People would want to have a meeting to discuss something, and those were the very people who would say, we have too many meetings, I can't get any work done. Now, caution can be a really good thing if it leads to less bugs, less stress, also, I get the fact that because games cost more now, your people are approaching it with this sense of caution because yep. you're not just going to be out a little bit of money. You're going to be out a lot of money if this game doesn't do well. The thing that worries me, though, is games can also be a lot worse because of caution. And everybody who's cautious kind of denies that. They're like, no, it'll. we're reducing bugs. We're incre increasing life work balance people are less stressed and i'm like true mm -hmm. i don't understand this caution principle he probably means something else but he's using the word caution but, but you're also taking a lot less risk in a game which in many games i think give them less charm and yeah even games that have jank yeah i'm currently slightly confused does he mean caution as in people do their job with more caution or Caution as in games are uh, games are just more cautious in general. Like for example, Starfield, uh, you, 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 there's no gore anymore. There's there's no huge messes of anything, which is cautious, but it's an absolute detriment to you know the the player experience. Starfield alone would have been like two times better of a game if it just had that, but it doesn't have a lot of charm my games have had jank uh i know people talk about jank in other games you know things where the ai, AI acts in a bizarre way in certain circumstances or npcs say weird things or do weird things it can be charming but things have changed and i know games have gone from being an expression of an idea of an okay of, like artwork from a particular person or group of people into a corporate driven money seeking instrument and i get it there's a lot of money going into these in a way though i would argue they always were you always were making these with the idea that you know i You've hope it's make a lot. money, make money. Yes. but now designs are being driven by this that's why we have microtransactions it's why we have pre-orders it's why we have what we're starting to see lately where games or if you pay a little more, you can play it a few days or even a week early. That's... Now, you can't always get blamed. The... Oh, that's called early access. Right, right, right. Pre-orders, early access, different things. Uh, Forgot, excuse the me. Publishers Disclosing. or the developers for this. If people didn't pay for it, they wouldn't do it. Yep. It's like spam. If everybody stopped an answering spam tomorrow, it would go away. But because a tiny percentage does, it's there for everybody to see. But... So I'm not really talking about the money-driven part. I'm talking about how the caution is dampening down the ideas. It's why I'm going to double down on this. I've always thought the indie space is a lot richer in ideas. Probably not money. Certainly not money. But they're much richer in ideas because they no, take... Oh, obviously. Less, uh, they take... They have... Indies... One of the things that those people understand is that they need to experiment, right? They, they, an indie development studio can't... can't can't try to succeed by remaking Fallout. Because one, they're gonna get sued. <laughs> Two, uh, wh who wants bootleg Fallout in the first place? Probably not a lot of people, that's just the reality of it. So you need to make something original as an indie developer to stand out. You need to either make something original or something extremely, extremely good. But even that extremely, extremely good will have original things to it. Think about most indie games that uh, come out. 
yeah, sure, they're not 100% fully original, like, you know, you have seen systems, game is the game mechanics and things like that in other games, sure. But it feels authentic, and they do it really, really good. That's usually the indies that succeed. Less caution and take a lot more risk. And unfortunately, what I see then is um, AAAs that dip into indie games for features and ideas. By the way, it's not just publishers and developers that I see all this caution with. I've seen a huge rise in caution in game journalism. It's become the norm. Oh, really? That no one want, no journalist wants to risk getting into an embargo situation. No journalist wants... This is what we also saw with Starfield. IGN was the only one that pretty much just gave them a 7 out of 10, while everyone else was giving them a 10 out of 10. If everyone... Is rating something a 0 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10? You don't want to be the guy who suddenly does the opposite of that. If everyone's rating it poorly, you pro the best you can do is try to rate it almost midway. Right? If everyone's rating it extremely well, you rate it well, but not excellent. That is also a downfall of journalism. Situation where they're not given a an early access code, so they can't write Obviously. the reviews earlier than other people. Starfield They're again. They're worried about not being invited <laughs> to press events or, you know, junkets, I think they're called. So a lot of them have gone a lot more cautious in what they say. I really miss the reviews. I'll name a couple, like Scorpia in the 80s and 90s and Deslock in the 90s and early 2000s. No idea because what those are. Those two people, those two reviewers said what they thought. If you put oh, out a game, people? they'd skewer you for all the things that were wrong with it, but then they'd praise you for everything that's right with it. Now, it's sort of like, well, we really like this, but they don't want to like really double down on it because it may be something people don't like. So like, let's say a journalist loves the diversity in a game. He may go, well, I'm not going to say that that much because I don't want to come across as being pandering and also some people yell when you talk about that. So I just see a lot of the passion drain out of game journalism. And they're really just trying to go for how, what can what kind of review can I write that generates the most clicks, and I guess this worries me because if I see this everywhere, if I see this in publishers and developers, and now new people entering the industry, they they don't have this passion anymore. So, you know, what's the moral of all this? I'm, I I want to tell people just go and make it, make what you want. You don't need a committee hmm. to sign off on it. You can well, always go back and change do. it, or if you make something and it turns out not to be good at all, and uns well, you actually do mostly need a committee that signs off on it. Salvageable, throw it away. But that that rapid iteration to get to some really good idea is a lot better than just being so cautious that you basically creep up to a very mundane game that doesn't show any kind of passion in its development. People can tell. People can tell. So. I started with stories. Let me end with those three stories and how they kind of got resolved. So I didn't even try to do the whiteboard solution when I made Our Worlds. What I did is I made my own Confluence page called, like, I was Tim Kaine's Top 10 or something. It was in my Confluence space, and I wrote, here are the 10 biggest things I want looked at this week. And there were a few producers who would look at that page all the time. What was great about this solution? Nobody could come and complain to me about it because it was in my confluence space. No I don't know what's a confluence public space, though. Confluence space. Also, I'd like to point out that anybody could go to Jira at any time and say, what are the 10 most high prior highly prioritized bugs and who are they assigned to? So we already have Oh, that, I know what's Jira. I have heard about it. This is the thing that computer nerds use. Oh, I, it, it's like a queue system or what they're going to do system because the com computer people are too stupid to just... Because they're too stupid to, uh, to get their work done with, without that? Oh, it's really confusing. Virtually? Well, it's not confusing. I just have heard the name because that's like a cue that they do. I I, I don't know. It, it's it's for c computer people.
who are barely people to begin with anyway. But anyway, let's move on. But somehow it was okay that it wasn't called attention to. For the combat aggression code, I think I settled on two weeks, and I think it got done faster than that. Great, I got it. I don't think I asked for anything after that. I didn't go and specifically ask for anything because I realized that I was being viewed as some sort of ogre when I knew something could be done faster. Well, this is also the thing. Uh, And I will say this, this this is clearly a weakness of this dude. So... He's in... I don't actually know this person, right? But clearly from everything he is saying, it, it is blatantly obvious that he is at, uh, at, at least some uh, some very, very visible notion of power, position of power, in whatever the, uh, whatever company he works in, right? Or maybe he's the actual owner. I, I don't fucking know. But if he was the owner, he would probably fire those people. So, you know, probably, so, uh, probably a step uh, below that. You see, the thing that good leaders do is they don't just find capable people. They find capable people who know how to learn, who understand how to learn. Like, one of the things that really, really capable people test are not just how good this person is at their potential job, but how good this person is at... uh, so uh, a social interaction it's bigger than you think social interaction and how good they are at learning okay this is what truly uh, truly good pe- uh, uh, good le- uh, leaders do this is what truly good bosses do they because no uh, i have said this a million times and i'll say this again because this is a perfect opportunity if you are a genius in your field Literally, there's no one better than you, but you don't have like 50 trillion accomplishments below you, but you are without a doubt instantaneously one of the best in your field. If your field requires social interaction with other people, you're probably not going to get hired. Unless your field requires you to not interact socially with people at all, you're probably not going to get hired. Because no one wants to deal with an obnoxious piece of shit, okay? That is the reality. Someone, if this is the middle, if this is the middle of skill and someone with this much more skill, and this is like, you know, above average, this is hugely above average, this is above average. If these two people compete and this person's social skill is below average and that person's social skill is just average, the average average wins out. Social skills matter, okay? And the second one, the the big part here is, it's the fact that people understand that people need to know, uh, know how to learn things. Uh, I instantaneously just fault this guy for being a bad leader. Because he's not trying to teach the guy who uh, is supposed to write the thing. He's uh, Being a leader is not only just about saying, Hey, you do this, you do that, you do this. And being like next level and say, Haha, you're good at this, so you do that. And you're good at this, so you do that. No. It's about actually making sure people under you are capable of learning things that are important. For example, in this situation, okay, yeah, so a guy did it in, uh, a guy was supposed to do it in two weeks, and you know it's doable in 30 minutes? How do you not... I'm mind blown that you don't instantaneously have someone ready in line To teach other people skills. To teach how to do this properly or to uh, teach how to learn uh, learn stuff. For example, that was one of the things uh, I uh, I had to do in uh, one of my jobs as an analyst. Um, When when other people, new people started coming. when When there was a position. I was sent to give them a crash course of uh, how to think and how to do things. Because I was good at it, okay? So, yeah, uh, this is very surprising that this uh, this kind of stuff is not even done here, that he doesn't uh, try... He could teach uh, teach himself that guy or whoever uh, was coding it and it would have been so much better. It, it's crazy. 
And there was no solution to it, which is why years ago I started thinking, ooh, this is becoming a problem. Same thing with Leonard and I yelling at each other. We just kept doing it. We're like, it's our office. We're shut Smart. the door. We're not mad at each other. But this is the way we get things done. Note, noted that people don't, some people don't like it. We won't get things done like that with you. And let me tell you, I think there were people who felt like they missed out. Also, people who hear people yelling and don't have the social uh, skills to figure out, oh, wait a minute, this is good yelling or this is bad yelling. And yes, there, there is good yelling and there's bad yelling. Again, deal with it. If you don't know this, well, congratulations. You just got smarter. But it, it, if you hear two people yelling and you're like, hmm, I wonder if this is good or bad yelling. That's that that that's also uh, also uh, just shows how you know you don't have these skills you don't have this understanding that there's a difference on not being parts of those conversations. Some people would come over. Uh, Charlie um, had his office right next door, and he would the lead designer on on Outer mm. Worlds, and he would come in sometimes and join in. Great. Other people didn't do that. You missed out, and I think you. Yep. True. True, true. So, one of the things people don't understand about business and things like that, you often see this, right? Everyone probably has seen that someone comes to your boss and just starts talking to them about some kind of shit. And you think they're having fun. You think this is not even work, probably. In reality, it is work, you know? The... the and this is, by the way, a, v a, v a very telling thing. If you don't understand what he's talking about here, you are not a valued employee. Okay? You're not a valued employee. You're not in a good position, probably. Well, you could be in a good position, but you're, ju you're, you're, you're just never moving away from that position, right? That's also a possibility. But yeah. People just come and talk about stuff that needs to happen constantly because that's the process of figuring things out. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why I really, really love business and why I'm constantly thinking time to time, man, maybe I shouldn't make money as a YouTuber because I miss the corporate world so, so, so much. I really, really do. Because it is fun at the end of the day if you're not at the bottom. It is really, really fun. You missed out on some really fun, active, engaging conversations yeah. about game development. But that's the way Ideas, what's happening, how things are going to look, how far things are along. People talk about this constantly. And if you're in a high enough position, you understand this because you were a part of it. Okay? You... You don't need to be the, uh, the the head of a department or the the lead of a team in a department. You just need to be competent, and that's when you get in on these conversations. Again, I didn't start off in a super high position just at random in uh, in a business. No, I started in a low position, and then just job skip. So, I'm not sure I have a great solution other than telling people reminding people to be passionate but i just kind of want to talk about this because it kind of ties into bigger teams and longer development time and bigger budgets just this whole game development caution that's rising up in the industry yeah the way he's saying this the way he's talking about this it's just incompetence it's just a lot of incompetence uh, this is what I said will happen to Blizzard, and this guy pretty much just, you know, concretely gives me the green light that I'm right on this. I said this about Blizzard. When there's scandal about the milk and everything happened, I, I said that they're gonna course correct way too hard. They're gonna get rid of all the people who were not, uh, who, well, they're gonna just add in a bunch of pink haired lunatics. That's what they're gonna do. And that's seemingly what they did. And now they're paying the price for it. Because those people are incompetent. Those people literally cannot uh, deal with yelling at all. And the reality is, doesn't matter how bad the previous people are, were, the fact that they were bad, that they had those qualities, just means that they are, that they were 100% 
better employees, workers, and leaders in general. Even if they did all of those bad things. Because people... There are traits that the pink-haired ones have that no good leader I have ever seen has. And it's it's not mixable and manageable. It's always bad. Anyway, this was Quizzer Said Said. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and already and have a nice day. Bye-bye.